I don't catch another fish the rest of my life, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. More importantly, I want to see my kids. You're going to make me cry. (laughs) I want to see my kids catch fish. I want to spend time with my family um, catching fish. Like even, even today, like I'm busy, bro, bro. You're going to make me cry. (laughs) Um, I'm I'm busy and we work hard and um, I'm doing all this with an effort. Cause my kids are young. I got, I got a one year old and I got three year old. And uh, so it's when dad's gone a lot, it's, they don't, I'm, my prayer is they don't remember cause I'm gone a lot. Um, so my hope is to get this ball rolling into a point <clears throat> where I can spend less time building memories with families who aren't mine. Because as a fishing guide, I spend a lot of time with families <laughs> who aren't mine, mm-hmm. um, which is awesome. I love it. I love it. Don't hear me correctly, but I want to have that experience with my kids. This is the Aptitude Outdoors podcast, where we interview conservationists, hunters, anglers, and outdoorsmen and women to bring you the greatest stories, information, and advice from the best in the world. I don't know about you, but I always carry a knife. It doesn't matter what the situation is, I'm always reaching for a blade. Whether I'm out hunting in the backwoods, fishing on lakes and rivers, or simply cutting rope at camp, and when I need a tool, I want something that's quality, durable, and handmade right here in the USA. I know that's something you're looking for as well, so go to MaloneKnives.com and get yourself something that's going to last and look damn good too. I'm a huge fanatic for handmade, high-quality leather and canvas products. In my opinion, they last longer, hold up better to the abuses of travel, and honestly, they just look really cool. That's why I use Badger Claw Outfitters. They've been making handcrafted products for hunting, camping, and travel since 2011, and that's right up my alley. The best part is they're made right here in the USA and are guaranteed for life. They've got everything from gun leather, belts, custom knife sheets, wallets, duffel bags, leather and canvas pouches, everyday carry items, and more. Badger Claw Outfitters, made in the USA, built for the wild. One of the questions that I like really have to ask people who are guides, especially with fishing, because everybody's dream is to just fish all the time. So is it all it's cracked up to be to fish all the time, every day? I I don't go fishing all the time. I mean, I'm going on the water tomorrow. Yes. And uh, there will be people fishing with me, but I won't be fishing. See, that's a huge, a huge misconception. Um, if I have kids on the boat, I'm fishing. Yeah. Because then our, our success rate goes up, you know, and then we can trade out rods and then we can work together. We can get that figured out and then I can back off and they can fish. Uh, but even then it's not, I'm not fishing. I'm, I'm fishing. I'm power fishing. I'm, my job is to get those kids hooked on fish and, and, and as many as they can. Cause when they're happy, mama and daddy are happy. And then that means I'm going to get a, a paycheck and they're going to come back and they're going to tell their friends. Uh, but outside of that, I'm not fishing. You know, my job is to have the boat prepared. Uh, my job is to have all the gear ready to go uh, and to know where to go and know how the fish are going to respond. And then, um, at, you know, at the end of the day, I still don't have control. I don't have control. They're animals. They're fish. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's nature. Uh, I say three things have to happen for a successful guided fishing trip. Number one, I have to put you on fish. Number two, you have to present to that fish. You have to cast to that fish. You can't just cast at the fish or in the in the area. You have to present to the fish. And then number three, the fish has to eat it. And if any of the three jobs aren't done, um, it's not successful in the terms of catching fish. Uh, but you know, we're gonna learn something. We're gonna have fun. We're gonna go out on the water. We're gonna we're not at work. I'm yeah. at work, but they're not yeah. at work. So uh, all of that is, is is great. And the fish are just the bonus, you know, and I try to really uh, get that into people's brains um, and to manage expectations. You know, I want people to relax. I want them to have fun. Um, 
again, my job is to put you on fish, but man, I'm not, I'm not fishing every day. Yeah. That's but I will say I've had the nine to five. <laughs> I've been there and it, this is so much better than that. Yeah. All my buddies who do guiding, they're like, people just think we go out and fish all day. And they're like, it's so much work. It is not like when you get to go fish, like, uh, like I went, I've gone fishing with the guys, with guys who are guides. And I'm like, you can fish because you're my friend and I know you, I don't care. And they're like, Oh, thank God. I'd never get to fish. I'm always just like, squ- like holding bait in my hand and getting like hooked all the time by other people is like, you know, I, I love that. So I have a, I've been really getting into like fish. I live up in the Great Lakes region, so I've been getting like fishing hardcore over the last couple of years. And I have a I have a, a tricky question for you. And I was thinking about this before we got started. I said it's like pretend you're blindfolded. You're you're in. You just get dropped off at a lake, freshwater lake. It, it could be anywhere in the United States. You have a hundred dollar bill, and the only place you could get outfitted to go is a Walmart. What's your plan of attack? You have a hundred bucks. You're at a lake you've never been to before. What's your plan of attack? Where are you going to, like, what are you going to do first thing right off the gate? Yeah, I'm at the Walmart, right? You're, 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 Walmart. Yeah. You're, you can see, you can look at the lake, then you can go to the Walmart. You can go to the Walmart, then you can look at the lake, whatever you want to do. You're just in this scenario, fake. Simple. I, I, I'm going to buy one spinner rod, with, so a reel and a rod, um, braided line. It doesn't matter. I could bet mono line. That would save me some money. And I'm going to buy uh, a jerk bait. I'm going to buy a Rapala X wrap. Uh, it looks like a bait fish. It wiggles. It rattles. It shakes. I've caught 15 different species on that one lure from fresh to salt water. I don't care where you are. That thing catches fish. So <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. I might buy a couple of them. Um, and I'll probably buy a cheap pair of pliers if I don't have any tools with me. But other than that, I mean, I'm good. I'm golden. I can do that in under hundred bucks. Yeah. And then when, and you get to the la- when you get to the lake, what are you doing? What's your first like plan of attack? You don't have a boat. You oh. don't have anything. You're just go. You're just. You're just oh, there. I don't have a boat. Oh, I just I'll sneak you know through people's backyards and we'll, we're gonna we're gonna make it happen. We're gonna catch some fish. We're gonna find some structure. We're gonna cast parallel. We're gonna cast around docks. We're gonna. I'm going to go, maybe go see if there's someone fishing and go and talk to them. Hey man, what you doing? Where you, where are you going? Or, um, try to sound, Hey, how's it going? I'm a real nice guy. You got space on your boat. Can we go fishing together? You know, try to be nice to people. Maybe they'll take you fishing. Or maybe if I ask them change from the Walmart experience, be like, yo bro, I got 20 bucks. Yeah. Gas. Come on. We can even just troll the motor around the lake and we'll bring you make 20 bucks. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing. That's a sign of a true <laughs> that's a great question, dude. That's that's a, that's a sign of a true professional because like when you ask people that don't know anything about fishing, they're just like panic because all they know how to do is buy stuff and hope that it works. And like I, I love that. I like you're just like fishing pole, a bait, let's go. I'm here to have fun. I'm here to fish. And I love that. that's so, that's like what I tell everyone. Like just go get a thirty dollar rod if you want to start fishing. Who cares? Like just get into it. That's my whole thing. So when I do I do. I spend so much time fishing. I didn't grow up with, you know, my parents are hardworking people. They, they weren't, I'm not a trust fund baby. They didn't just have thousands and thousands of dollars to give me to go buy fishing gear. I would mow the lawn. I would mow for my grandma. I remember one time we, we I was a kid and I watched the bill dance show and he was used. I, don't, I think they, I don't know if they still make it. Blue Fox was the brand. It's actually owned by Rapala. It's one of their okay. sister companies. And we went to Walmart and I was so stoked because I just watched the show and I was like, dad, I got to get, I got, well, I don't call him dad. I call him pop pop. I got to get this lure. And he's like, all right, all right, let's go. So we went, and I'm so excited. We bought it. We ran out the store, got in the car, got home. I was so pumped. And then I realized I left the stupid thing in the cart. I was so excited <laughs> about going home and tying it on that I just hopped in the car. And totally loved it. So now I'm, I must have been like seven or eight years old, and we're driving back to Walmart, and I'm just praying, please, Jesus, please let that lure be there. And it was, sure enough, it was still there. Granted, we were only gone for maybe 30 minutes, but yeah. Yeah, and I think I still have that stupid thing too. It's probably in my, my collection of stuff, but. Well, you already yeah, answered man. my next question. I was going to ask, are you a Bill Dance fan? Because I just like <laughs> recently in my adult life got, he, he has a YouTube channel with like all of his newer fishing stuff on it. I watch that, that obsessively. That I love it. I just love watching Bill Dance. Listen, I, uh, at ICAST last year, so 2022, 
I waited in line for like an hour and a half and he was late. And I guess he's Bill Dance. He can be late. Like he was supposed to be at a, like a meet and greet at three o'clock. And, uh, my wife's just kind of, all right, he's not here. What's the plan? I'm like, babe, just go walk around, go look at stuff, go get some free stuff for the kids. I'm going to wait. And then I was the first person in line, and I had a book. Uh, one of his books that he had written and he looked at it and he's like, man, this thing's old. And I was like, yeah, dude. And he signed it for me. We're good to go. But uh, yeah, dude, I, I'm a Bill Dance fan. I, dude, I grew up watching all these guys. In fact, I was at ICAST several years ago. This is TMI. I shouldn't tell you this, <laughs> but I'm in, the bathroom. I'm in the bathroom and I'm standing at the urinal. Uh, sorry to any of the women who are watching and listening to this. I'm so totally sorry. <laughs> And you know, you kind of have a rule when you're peeing, you know, in a public place. You yeah, don't yeah. look around. You just kind of do your thing do and you leave. Thing, yeah. But this guy walks in and he stands beside me and he's like coughing or something, clearing his throat. And I kind of glance over and I look back and I was like, Jimmy Houston is <laughs> peeing right beside me. <laughs> so I get out of the bathroom <laughs> and I call my dad. I'm like, Pops, guess what? He's like, what, man? Why are you so excited? I'm like, Jimmy Houston was just peeing beside me. <laughs> I'm That's like, what? I'm a little kid. I'm, I, I'm, I have loved fishing, dude, my whole life. I've been watching fishing shows since I was a kid. So seeing, seeing Jimmy Houston, who's a totally down to earth guy, who, when I watched the interview with him recently and he was ragging on Roland Martin and Billy, he's such a cut up and it was awesome. But I wouldn't say anything. Obviously, he was, he was peeing yeah, and so yeah, yeah. so I wasn't going to say anything, but <laughs> it was cool, man. It's crazy. Yeah. That's awesome. And, you know, it's funny you mentioned that with old books. I just, I got this weird obsession with like really old fishing and hunting books right now. I don't know what it is, but I just have like stacks of like in fisherman books at my house from like the 80s and the 70s and stuff. And I just love them because for me, I mean, I grew up in this age with all this technology and stuff. I mean, like, I was in that gap where when I was in grade school, they had just put out like the first computers in grade schools. And now we're here doing zoom and stuff like that all, all day, every day. And these old books just give me like such a sense. Cause it's not like buy the newest $3,000 Garmin thing. They're like, you're going to have to sit in the lake for 15 hours and find every piece of structure <laughs> in the bottom by bumping a weight along the bottom. And I'm like, man, we have it so easy now. Like with all the technology we have, like with the even with the newer fish finders where you can like drop your bait on the nose of the fish. Watch I'm just it like go down. Yeah, like this is a video <laughs> game now. So do you do you like do you ever just get nostalgic about like old school fishing? Because they they the technology just exploded in probably the last like, I don't know, thirty years, twenty years even. It's just like you can get anything anywhere, anytime. It's insane. So you were the guy who was outbidding me on eBay on some of these books, weren't you? Probably, yeah. Probably. <laughs> I uh, I tell you, Mark Sosin recently, well, he died uh, over the summer, um, probably June of last year. And um, I bought, I, I was like, man, I would have loved to have met him. I would love to talk to him. So I, I went on eBay and I bought a bunch, <clears throat> excuse me, so a bunch of his books, one of which was his, uh, his memoir, a um, ton of fishing stories, like hundreds. And they're all, they're, they're written for me because they are a page and a half is the whole story. And that's about my, yeah. my ability to sit and read for a while. And uh, so I bought that and then I bought that Bill Dance book and I bought several books. I bought a few um, Mark Sosin books. Um, I bought one uh, by Chico Fernandez, um, how to, how to fly fish for uh, bonefish. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and I bought a Roland Martin book. So I started buying all these books. I actually bought the same book twice on accident. Um, it was that good. I bought it twice. Um, <laughs> but I went to ICAST last year and I was able to meet and I actually had lunch with Chico and he, we had a great conversation, uh, talked for about an hour and, um, talked fishing and talked just life and just his experiences, stories. And he signed my book and then I had Bill sign my book. Yeah. I, you know, fishing has changed a whole lot. And you know what? That lure I was telling you about, that X rat. I mean, how long have they been making Rapala beer baits? Mm -hmm. fish and, the fish haven't changed that much. They've gotten a little smarter. Uh, and you, you definitely have to be on your A game. You have to, it's pretty, it's become pretty technical. Um, recently, we've switched over to using side scan and we'll drive around and, and mark, 
fish, look for fish around structure on bridges. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking, man, for before this stuff was invented, these how long were these fish sitting here? I mean, they've probably been doing this around this bridge since they built the bridge. Yeah. And we had no idea. You know, you always have your guys that are anchoring up at the bridge and chunking bait and, and waiting and oh man, I caught a big one this day. But these fish are always moving. And we're able to drive around the bridge, idle, or use your trolling motor. And I'm just focused on my 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 Garmin. And hell, there they are. And I just say, hey, just drop it. And I tell my clients, hey, drop it. They're right there, 20 feet, all the way down the bottom. And then, oh, oh, yeah, there he is. And they got, that's that's literally, it's, you said it, it's a video game. Um, but, you know, that's not my favorite I, I like to hunt these fish. I like to get out on the flats and and pull a boat, pull a skiff, and actively pursue these fish. That, to me, is my favorite. Seeing them, presenting to them, and then watching the fish react, whether it be blowing out because you made a terrible cast or spooking because they heard the boat or they see the lure and they respond to it. And they respond the way you want them to. And they come up and just crush it. And I love that. And that gets me so amped up. And so when I'm able to have a client on the front of my boat, some dude that's been fishing on ice for months up in Michigan, whatever, and he comes down to Florida because he needs to, yeah, exactly, right? He needs to uh, uh, thaw out. So he comes down here to go fishing and we get out there and then you he sees those fish and then he lights up and then he makes the right cast and the fish eats it. Bro, he's going to be talking about that the rest of his year. Yeah, and That never never gets old that's um, just, that's like a that's like a primal human experience to like see something and go after it whether it's deer fish squirrel what i mean whatever you're doing in the in the outdoors world that's like i feel like that's where like humanity is just like in its prime moment like I see that thing. I'm hungry. I'm going for it. And I like, I'm the same way. I love that. Does I, I've been hunting up here, deer hunting all year and or all season. And I, like, I just get bored. Cause I like to go. That's why I like, I, I bought a kayak. I love kayak fishing. Cause you just go, you just explore, you dump it in anywhere and you just go after it. You could be out there six, seven hours. Who gives a crap? And, and that's like, that's my favorite thing ever. And one of the things I really like about your show, which we'll dive into here a little bit too, is like, you just have like, like, just like you have now in the pocket, you just have this energy. Like you, I've seen you catch small fish. I've seen you catch huge fish and you're just amped. And I think that's a good way to be because like a lot of people, especially with television in the past, I mean, growing up, it's like everybody's catching monsters all the time. They're getting the biggest deer, the biggest fish. And like, I think that o- over time that gets discouraging for a lot of people. Cause they're, they're like, well, I never catch anything like that. What the heck's I'm going on? So, I mean, I, I think your show brings that a, a really good energy with enthusiasm, but it also is like, you're realistic. You're showing people how to do things instead of being like, I'm the best fisherman ever. I only catch 12 pound bass, you know, which you do catch That's big energy. giant bass, but um, you know what I'm saying? So like, where did that ethic come from? Because not everybody has that. Listen to me, I, I, I literally just posted this on Instagram, this exact phrase, Every fish is a good fish. Some are just bigger than others. Um, we have an episode com- uh, coming out um, next weekend. Um, for those who are going whenever this comes out, we have an episode coming out about Slidell, Louisiana, where we're catching uh, Jacks, Jack Crevel. The entire episode is dedicated to catching Jack Crevel. Uh, and in the narration, I talk about how um, people consider Jacks a trash fish. Uh, no no this thing dude these fish they were blowing up our our lures we were throwing giant tuna plugs at these fish using 100 pound braid 150 pound leader and we still broke off you can't tell me that's a trash fish you can't do that and think that's a trash fish and dude i've been i've been up in the mountains catching brookie the size of lures I'll throw at 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 redfish or yeah. at tarp and was just as excited. If I if, if I ever I've said this a few times, if I ever lose that passion or that excitement to catch fish, I don't know what I'll do. 
I've, I've joked and said I'll take up golf, but I hate golf. I'm terrible <laughs> at golf. You know, I'm too much of a control freak, and I hit the ball. And it goes way out of the right. I'm like, yeah. Come on. It makes no sense. Um, but I just love catching fish. I don't care. Like, we were filming the other day, and we we caught a bunch of bluefish, and they weren't our target. I didn't care. They were fun. They were yeah. a blast. Um, yeah. And that's that's just my dad and I, that's how he raised me. We We just went fishing. And it wasn't about catching monsters. It was about spending time together. It's about being outside. When I was a teacher, um, I was with children all day long, eight hours a day, five days a week. If you've never been in a group of children, I'm going to let you know they're loud. They're really loud. And then I'd, I'd come home. And uh, at the time I had a couple of roommates and one of the roommates I'm married now. I don't have roommates anymore. I have children and a wife. <laughs> yeah. Those are kind of roommates. Sort of. Yeah. Um, but I had a roommate that was uh, a record. Um, he, he recorded music uh, and edited music and he did it at home. So we had a studio at the house. And so there was always music and it wasn't like country music or like something like this. It was like, ah, screamo, Rocco, like, Oh my goodness. Loud. And, um, and then I'd go to the gym and I went to a CrossFit gym and they blare music. The only place I had quiet, the only time I could escape was out on the water. Mm-hmm. And the water is still my escape. I, uh, I guide, I'm on the water four or five days a week and I don't fish. And I get home and I, my wife's like, I tell her, I was like, I need a day off. I want to go fishing. Even when we're filming the show, I'm, I mean, there's stress there. There's, mm-hmm. I'm, we're thinking about the camera guys and their angles. I'm thinking about what am I saying? Am I smiling? Am I, am I too serious? We were filming the other day and man, my stomach was killing me. And I had a headache. I'm like, this is the worst time for me to be out here filming. I feel <laughs> terrible. Uh, so there's always, you know, am I making the cast? Am I making the presentation? Am, am I screwing up? These are all things I'm thinking about. So yeah, I'm fishing. I'm having fun, but it's not that escape. Uh, and still today, man, that's, that's, that's how I online. It's how I relax. I love, I love going fishing. I love being on the water. Um, so we try to show that with the show. We try to showcase realistic stuff on the show, but yet still try to keep it exciting. Um, and yeah, we want to catch big fish. Who doesn't want to catch big fish? I love catching big fish. Um, this recent episode, um, we just filmed the finale a couple of days ago, uh, for season four. And we were, dude, we were tucked in this creek. It was beautiful. Spartina grass around us. We were in eight inches of water with oysters all underneath the boat. And, and I know this because not because I could see them because the water was real muddy, but you could hear it like crunch it on the bottom of the boat. And it was cold. It was chilly. And uh, I made my presentation. I couldn't, didn't see the fish, and the fish beelined it for the for the lure and ate literally at my feet. And I I came back, I reared back, I set the hook, and the fish did exactly what I needed to do. It spun around at 180 and went away from us up the creek. That's what I needed to do. Uh, so then I can keep my rod high. I can get the fish up to the surface. He can thrash around. He can wear himself out, and I can get him to the boat instead of bringing him to the boat green. Well, he did that for about 20 feet. And then he did another 180 and he came back to us and the fish ran under the boat and you could hear him like hitting the bottom of the boat with his body and his tail. And then he broke off and the guy we were fishing was like, Oh, like, Oh man, like we needed that fish. That'd been awesome. And I'm, and I'm, I can see Jack like still rolling in my head. I'm saying, keep rolling because I want this on the episode. There was mm-hmm. nothing, nothing we could do. And yet it was, it was all a part of our day. Um, and so, yeah, we, we try to keep it exciting and we, and we try to keep it busy and we catch fish. Um, but some days, some days it's a grind and that's yeah. just how it is. Yeah. It's realistic. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I literally just put out a solo episode like two weeks ago where I was talking about exactly what you just said. And like, you don't, especially when it comes to anything outdoors, hunting, fishing, backpacking. I mean, you, you name it. If you're outside, the level of control you have is so minimal because especially with like consumptive activities like hunting and fishing, you're, you're dealing with another being essentially. And I mean, they do not want to get caught. They don't want to, you know, get shot at or whatever is going on. And they're like the hardest thing when I'm trying to get my buddies into the outdoors is explaining that to them. Like we had to just cancel an ice fishing trip because it's literally like 50 degrees out right now up here in Ohio. And my buddy's just bumming hard because he like loves ice fishing. I was like, dude, 
this is the outdoors, baby. You don't get a say. Like, it is what it is. And that's, for me, that's like the best thing I could have ever learned in my life is like, it ain't up to me, man. I'm just out here doing what I can when I can. Some days there's a thunderstorm. You don't go out on the water. You just got to call it a day. And that's what it is. And that's what the outdoors is to me. I think it is the same thing you said earlier. It's just like this place where you can, it's the only time I'm not on my phone is when I'm out fishing or something because it's like I don't want to be on my phone. I don't care about Instagram. I don't care about YouTube. I care about this fish and me in this boat right now. And that's all I care about. And that's I, yeah. I think that's so awesome that like you said that. And at this point in your life, you've been fishing since you were three, which is very that's I mean, most people don't have that much experience fishing. When you think about a trip you're doing or when you think about the like the water you're going to be fishing, whether it be saltwater, freshwater, how much just is internalized now? Like I think this time of year, this temperature, this wind, the fish are going to probably be over here in this scenario. How much of that is internalized and how much of that do you sit down and like look at the map and be like, all right, I got to do this today. Or do you ever have to kind of d- check yourself and like c- look through a book again? Like, eh, well, what should I do in this scenario? Like that's where I'm at now is like, when do you kind of internalize this? And when is it a continuous research in your like for life? You know? Well, it's, it's very funny that these fish tend to do and be in the same places year after year. It's just crazy. The only thing that changes is when will they be there? <laughs> so Going back to the show, it's called the captain's log. So keeping a journal of your fishing trips, whether that be through photos or some notes on your phone or really processing or writing down an actual journal, like those notes can be huge for you because then you can go back and go, all right, what were the conditions this day? Man, there's a front coming. In fact, there's a front coming. What day is it? It's Wednesday. There's a front coming here Friday. So we're two days out. Well, a month ago, two days prior to the cold front, was some of the best fishing we've had in a long time. So my brain is already thinking, okay, I got the same conditions that I had a month ago. We're going to have a south wind tomorrow. we got a cold front coming in two days. I bet you those fish are going to be the same place uh, that they were a month ago. But being a guide for seven years, being on the water every single day for seven years, I don't have to look back as much because um, I just remember, you know, when I was um, when I was in high school, I'd have coaches talk about football games and they'd say, oh, remember, we were playing this place and we had this happen. I'm like, how do you remember all that? It never made sense to me It's because I didn't care as much about it as I do the fishing. But when I get out on the water. I start remembering these things. Oh, I, 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 I caught a fish there. I, I, I remember what happened there. I remember exactly who I was with, when it happened. I remember the weather, I remember what I used. So uh, there's a saying, my dad says it all the time, and I'm going to mess it up. But um, the worst ink is still better than the best memory, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. writing things down uh, on having a journal and having pictures is going to not only help you, uh, it's going to, uh, it's just, just a secondary piece of, help when uh, when you're out on the water to your brain stuff um i have a gps on my boat um mainly to i look at it i, I had a guy the other day um he's like oh man are you using this to find fish like no i i, I use it for my clock there's a yeah. there's a clock on it and that's and i look at the water temperature because i'm curious and that's pretty much all i use it for because I've spent so much time out there, I know where I'm going. I don't. I don't need. The only thing that moves around is the manatees, <laughs> and, uh, and that you can't see anyways until you they freak out and you run into them anyways. Yeah. yeah. Um, but other than that, dude, it's it's just time and experience. I had a guy. Um, he met. I get I get emails all the time. Um, you know, what can I do to become a better guide, or what what piece of advice? Go fishing. Yeah. You don't know unless you go. Mm-hmm. That, that's it. Um, so going back to your re- regular original question, um, yes, I have a place where I can go back and review, but most of it, a lot of it is just because I've spent so much time. Life is hard, and we're out here doing larger-than-life things. Whether it's pushing ourselves physically in the outdoors or mentally at work or in the podcast studio, Absolute Aid is here to help you focus, recover, and stay calm during your most intense moments. Absolute Aid, created by nature, made with science for those who seek to do more. 
I'm newer to this to that world of like hunting and fishing. I mean, I grew up fishing because my my grandparents had a place up on a lake up in Michigan. I was around it, but I never like got into it to the way that I am now. Of like, I, I didn't understand that you had to like make an effort to learn to how to do it. I thought it was like I have a fishing pole, I have a bunch of like top water, you know, frogs and stuff, and I never catch anything on them. Like, what am I doing wrong? And then I was like. Well, you went to college and you read books to learn things. So why don't you learn about fishing that way? Because that's just how I learn. And like, you can you can read and you can study maps and all that you want. But if you're not out there trying to catch fish, it really doesn't help you in any way, shape, or form. And it's the same thing with the with the the GPS. They call fish finders. You can see fish on them all day long, sure, but that doesn't mean they're going to eat your lure. It's for yeah. me. I've been using them. I've learned that it's more of like a charting system to like read depths and stuff where fish could be. And yep. I think that's the most useful thing I've ever learned because there could be five thousand fish stacked under you, but they could just be minnows. You have no idea until you drop a lure down there. So <laughs> I really love that. And so on the on a conservation side, you know, I really like to to work on conservation issues. I've been fishing in Florida. I want to say three or four times. My family likes to go down there for vacations and stuff. And the first thing I do is look up charter boats when I get there of like where I can go fish for a day. And every single time I've been there, there's been issues with like the red dyed and die offs and like all these issues that I don't really have a lot of knowledge of, but it seems to kind of parallel up here with the great lakes. We have these giant algal blooms that really screw up everything from drinking water to like animal fish populations and stuff like that. So with the red tide for people up at my end of the, in the neck of the woods, how does that affect fish? Because I know it even changes like regulations and what you can and cannot catch. Cause over multiple years, they've been like, Oh, you can't catch trout this year at all. You can't keep any trout. And then the next year they're like, Oh, keep as many as you want or whatever the limit was. So like, how does that affect you guys down in the ocean areas? Okay. So, this is the state of Florida. This is real, very terrible. Depiction. That's the Michigan trick, but upside down. <laughs> yeah. So this is the Panhandle. This is the East Coast. So I'm I'm right here where my ring is. <clears throat> Red tide happens more down here, Southwest okay. Florida. So yep. from Tampa Bay down to Fort Myers, where mm-hmm. they just got hammered with that hurricane. Yep. Um, on the other side of the coast, on this side, south of Orlando on the East Coast, uh, they get a more blue green kind of algae where I'm at. It's a brown algae. Regardless, here's what's going on. There's a few things. There's lots of good stuff going on. Red tide is natural uh, and it's been going on for a long time. But what we're trying to figure out is why is it happening so much more frequently and such with such um, force it's just coming through and it's just knocking stuff out and it's killing fish it's killing mammals it's killing anything and everything on the water and then it's getting people sick so if you go down there to the beach with all these dead fish while red tides going on people are getting sick like Mm -hmm. it's burning their eyes and it's giving them stuff it's not good for you um so part of that uh on the southwest coast and through tampa bay is sewage dumps that's feeding it um and then the biggest part what they're trying to really work on is restoring the flow of water south from lake okeechobee down through the everglades um what's going on there is they they eliminated that and they're pumping water so back in the middle of the state think about okeechobee's right here there's a canal on either side there's a river on either side. This is Stewart area. And then this is Fort Myers, uh, Sanibel area. And they're forcing the water. They've dammed it up and they're forcing the water out because they, they have to do something. The water, the lakes are overflowing. Lake Okeechobee's overflowing. And to avoid flooding in the uh, area, they're pumping the water out, which is a, not a natural discharge, which is causing these algal blooms. Um, that's been a big part of it. Uh, on my coast, and I can speak more to my area because uh, this is where I live, mm-hmm. we have a brown algae. That's It's like Yoohoo. The water looks like Yoohoo. Um, and these cold fronts, these cold fronts are huge. They help. The cold fronts are a double-edged sword. They help because the colder water kills the brown algae. Summertime, the brown algae thrives. And what it does is it it sucks all of that oxygen out of the water. Think about it, if you had a fish tank and you have your bubbler, blah, 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 creating oxygen uh, for your, your, your fish. Well, 
if you stuck your thumb on that hose, all your oxygen is eventually going to wear out. And that's what happens is the microorganisms are in the fish are all in there breathing the, the oxygen, uh, dissolved oxygen is what it is. Um, and, and there's less of it when the water's hot. Now you have an algae that's fighting for it and it's going to win the battle and it literally sucks all of the oxygen and then you have a major fish kill. So when you have these cold fronts, the cold water, there's more dissolved oxygen and it actually kills uh, the brown algae. But if it's too cold, which is what we experienced uh, during Christmas Eve and Christmas Day uh, and a couple days after, uh, it got down in the 20s, which made that water temperature drop down in the upper 40s here on our lagoon systems. Mm-hmm. And it killed a ton, a ton of fish. Um, in fact, an area I had been fishing that had been holding a lot of snook, I, I, I went and checked on them and they, they were dead, floating everywhere. Uh, one of the ramps that I use, uh, very frequently, uh, Bears Cove ramp and it's, it's on Holliver Canal and it connects you to the Indian River Lagoon and the Mosquito Lagoon and there's dead snook everywhere. Um, so you need this cold water to kill that brown algae, but if it's too cold, you're going to lose your fish. So, it's a double-edged sword in that sense, um, but that's what's going on. And the reason we're having these, these brown algae blooms is being fed by uh, fertilizer and runoff. It's being the, the thing about there's homes on the rivers uh, and the lagoon systems, and there's local farms that runoff is getting funneled and dumped. Excuse me, into the river uh, in our lagoons. Uh, we also have. So many people living in these little towns. Uh, I do a lot of work in Titusville or a guide in Titusville, uh, which is right there on the Indian River. Titusville blew up because of NASA. NASA is right there. Okay. And their homes that were built are all built on septics. Well, then they started converting to sewage, but it's all antiquated. It's, it's falling apart. There's not enough to take care of the amount of people who have moved into the area. And as a result, they have to discard this extra sewage and their solution, unfortunately, is to dump into our lagoon systems. Um, and we're talking like a million gallons at a time, not, not like a couple gallons. All right. No big deal. It's going to dissolve in. No, no, no. We're talking a lot, a lot of sewage. And that again is just that feeds and, and, and helps push those algae blooms especially during the summer when it's hot so there's a few things going on thankfully yesterday uh, our governor signed a 3.5 billion dollar um, project plan uh, budget that's the word i'm looking for um, and it's going to pay for over four years 3.5 billion over four years pay for a lot of these water uh, management projects a lot of these a solution is the funding to, to these problems that we need we have because all of it is money it's going to take a ton of money and a hundred million of that for uh each year for four years so essentially 400 million dollars has been pledged to the indian river lagoon system which is from new Smyrna beach down to stewart um so there's there's a lot of money coming um now it's just a matter of holding the people who are getting a hold of this funds accountable, making sure it gets used correctly. Um, but the state has a lot of issues. Um, and a lot of it has to do, um, with the amount of people that live here, the amount of people that are moving here every single day. Um, yeah. and I'm not saying don't come to Florida. Don't hear me that I'm not saying that at all. It's just, we have to, as more people are coming, um, we need to, update our systems Mm -hmm. we need to and that all costs a lot a lot of money um i it i am saddened by how much they're building urban sprawl in central florida is crazy um i wish that would slow down you know i'm seeing more and more birds of prey um than ever before and and the only answer i have to that is they're losing their their habitat Mm -hmm. to build um, so I'd love to see that slow down. And thankfully, there are a lot of areas around that have been designated as uh, wildlife management areas, you know, and um, you know, refuges, refuges for these these birds and fish and whatnot. And that's good. We need that. Um, but it's all part of you know growing as a state, growing as a country. Yeah, and that's you know that's that's an issue that's happening all over in the United States, and and that's one of the reasons that I, I really like to talk about conservation is because it's like raising that awareness 
to to people who like to hunt and fish, it's it's like kind of our responsibility, especially as like people like you and me who are uh, talking about this stuff a lot and doing these activities a lot and like projecting it to the rest of the world is like, yes, it's fun. I love to hunt and fish more than anything on earth. If like, I just had this conversation with my buddy before we get started. I was like, the reason that I'm not rich is because if anybody gave me the option to go make money or go hunting and fishing, I'm going hunting and fishing hands down. There's no option on that. And it's like, you know, and and I think it's like a lot of these issues, like people know that there's bad stuff happening to the environment and there's bad thing happening to habitat where all the stuff we love to do lives. And it's just like the way you explained it just makes so much sense. And this is happening everywhere. Every single person that comes in this podcast has an issue like that where they live. And it's yeah. so important that we a understand these issues where we live and most importantly where we live because a pebble mine out West is affecting the people at West, but right here in the Great Lakes, I have algal bloom issues that I'm constantly learning about and fighting for. And you have the similar algal issues down where you're at. And it's like, we need to like push and make people aware so that they do get angry about it because we are losing land. We are losing habitat mm -hmm. for animals daily. And there's, I never thought I'd be caring about urban sprawl. I'm like, I like to go in the woods. What does this have to do with me? And it's like, well, it has everything to do with me because the more people build single family homes every 10 feet, you're wiping out trees where osprey and eagles and stuff of that can, can nest. And that's so important because like any part of that collapses that, that ecosystem, it just washes down to the very bottom, all the way up to the top. It's just a disaster. And then again, you were spending billions of dollars trying to fix it. And I don't know, I don't have answers. Yeah. All I know is that like, we all need to collectively understand these issues. And as outdoorsmen and women, like do stuff, join organizations, join anything to get involved and kind of put your voice out there. Because if enough people complain, they're, the government's going to end up helping or having to do something about it, you know, at the end of the day. So I, I love talking to people that know the issues because it's like, that's our job, you know, but uh, on a happier note, you went out on one of your episodes with my really good friend, Derek York. I was out on hit with him in the same area and I was just having flashbacks and like awesome memories. What was it like fishing with Derek, man, out there in Houston? It's just beautiful out there. Yeah. I never thought I would ever drive to Galveston area um, and let alone go fishing. I've had a lot of clients and friends, uh, clients who have become friends that live in that area. Um, I It was awesome. We, it was beautiful. And we took the fair, dude, we got there. We're like driving down this like little two lane road, no, like a little town and nothing, a little town and nothing. All of a sudden the road ends. And then my GPS said, <laughs> Drive onto a ferry. I'm like, what? So then we got onto a ferry and we drove over to, we rode, I went drive. We rode over uh, to Galveston Island and uh, we met that morning right outside Tiki Island, which is where I have some friends that live there in Tiki Island there in Texas. And uh, Derek's the man. Derek's just, he's just good people. Yes. And yeah. when we, we met at ICAST mm -hmm. a couple years ago, and uh, I was, I had just got out of a meeting at, at PowerPole and um, I'm like looking at my paper, all right, where gotta go next? And I could feel like, you know that feeling when someone's like staring at you and you yeah. know it? I'm like, someone's staring at me. And so I turn and there's Derek and Derek's now a little dude. He's a big dude. And he's like, how's it going? I'm like, Hey, he's like, I wanted to meet you. I'm Derek. And I'm like, Hey Derek, nice to meet you. I'm Jonathan. And, he, and so we just hit it off when we became friends and we have a lot in common uh, from fishing guide to our, our, our faith. So there's just a lot of camaraderie there. And uh, I was like, dude, we got to We got to go fishing. We got to film together. And he's just a good person, man. And I had a blast and he's like, let me do something different. Let's go catch triple tail. I'm like, yeah. Cause who thinks about going to Texas catching triple tail? Everyone you know, I talk to when it comes to Texas <clears throat> is either giant bass or it's redfish and trout. Mm -hmm. That's it. And so he's like, let's go catch triple tail. I'm like, okay, cool. Twist my yeah. arm. That sounds like a blast. <laughs> and then the day we were out there, I had no idea battleship Texas was being like literally. Oh yeah. Across the bay. Um, and there was a million people out and just watching. It was cool. Dude, 
Texas pride, Texas, everything people were excited about. It was very, very cool. Um, yeah. so that was a very, just, just a great day, a great experience. Um, and we started our morning with breakfast tacos. I mean, yes, any day <laughs> you can start your, your fishing with breakfast tacos. Absolutely. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, man. It, you know, I've, I've rented like, like some charter trips up in, in Northern Michigan. I've done like a bunch of different charter trips just because, I just don't have the equipment to go do like stuff like that a lot. So I got buddies up here. We love to go fishing. Every time I've been on a charter boat, and this isn't talking bad about charter captains. I know like it's a hard job. Everybody has their work. But every time I go out, like, dude, you're about to catch the biggest salmon you've ever caught. And I'm amped. And we go out there, catch a little trout. You're about to catch the biggest fish you've ever caught in your life. Go out there again, catch a little trout. Two different trips. And then I go down there. I fly down. I've known Derek for a while, for a few years now, too. He goes, we're going on the boat today. We're going to catch Cobia. We're going to get you a shark and we're going to catch a triple tail. And I'm like, okay, whatever. We get on the boat and I swear on anything, we go out to the oil rig. First 10 seconds we're out there. He pulls in a Cobia. 20 minutes later, he pulls in a shark. An hour later, we're back, or a few hours later, we're back on the brakes out there. He pulls in a triple tail, and I'm like, Derek, you're probably the best fishing guy that I've ever met in my entire life. He just, like, like he said it, we did it, and I was like, I'm impressed. I have nothing better to say. <laughs> I love that. I uh, I have been blessed to be able to fish with a lot of good, got a lot of good people on the show, and guys who have it uh, dialed in, and there are... You know, you, you had said something earlier. There are people who just can catch a fish in a bucket in that Walmart. You know, in that Walmart, I was supposed to go and spend a hundred bucks. Yeah, they're in the parking lot with a five gallon bucket pick, pulling fish out of it. There's just <laughs> people like that, yeah. and uh, and Derek's one of those guys. So, yeah. So I guess we skipped over this whole topic somehow. We just dived into the weeds right away. How did you get into a television show? You started as a as a teacher. You're a guide. How, where did the TV show come from? Because I did, a, I had a little TV show locally here in the past about the outdoors, and like it was fun. It was awesome. It, it lasted a couple seasons, and then I was like, you know, I really like podcasting like a ton. Like this is so much fun. So, how did you? Where did it come from? Where did the TV show side come from? Well, it's something I've always wanted to do, uh, but it's something I never thought would actually happen. Um, when I was a kid, there was a show called One More Cast with Shaw Grisby. It's a fishing show. Uh, I'm actually friends with Shaw Grisby now on Facebook. So he wrote, told me happy birthday about a month ago. And I was like, Shaw awesome. Grisby, you told me happy birthday. So, but when I was a kid, my dad and I would go fishing and he'd be like, yo, we got to go. I'm like, ah, oh, one more cast. And then he would say, ah, oh, instead of Shaw Grisby, it's one more cast with Jonathan Moss. Like you should have a fishing show. <laughs> so that's kind of planted the seed right there. And then um, 2012, summer of 2012, um, I was teaching I just got back from a trip out west and uh, did a, a kayak trip down the the Poudre River. So we, we were in Colorado and, and Wyoming and did some hiking and saw snow in June, end of June, and there's snow in the ground and this Florida kid freaking out. When I got home and I literally, I landed at midnight. Uh, I did laundry. I hooked my boat up and drove to the Keys the next morning. Um, and actually I didn't have my boat. It was, uh, I took my kayak. That's what it was. I put my kayak on my truck. And, uh, anyways, that night we were in uh marathon and we went under the Vaca cut. So there's a bridge and then Vaca cut connects the Gulf of Mexico to Atlantic and it's ripping and there's tarpon all over it. I mean, there was tarpon everywhere. Um, and I had that same Rapala lure, but I had a bigger one. I had the, uh, a number 10 X wrap. Um, and my buddy had a, um, an, he just got an iPhone. I don't know if they had just come out, but he had an iPhone and, and he's filming me fighting this fish. And I'm like talking to the camera and I'm fighting the fish. And, uh, one of my buddies grabbed the fish and then it broke off and I was so irritated, but we got it all on film and then it, it got deleted. Somehow it got deleted. And, that that there that moment that weekend that trip i was like this is what we need to do we need to come up with a website that has fishing videos and and we need to make our own videos and then we need to write a blog and we need to do podcast you know podcasting's been around for a long time it just kind of blew up the last several years we need to make a podcast 
And then we need to we need to hire a designer and make t-shirts and we need to sell the crap out of t-shirts too. It can pay for all of, dude. We did it, but we didn't make any money. But we had a lot of fun. But there was still that side of we went and we filmed and we came back and we and I I would edit and I was capturing these stories. Mm-hmm. And I loved it. I told you earlier, I don't, I don't like to read. I, I try and I do. Um, but I'm a doer. I'm not a sit down and, and I'm not a bookworm. Uh, I like to go and have an experience. I don't want to read about your experience. I want to go and do that experience. Um, but these short stories about fishing, um, skinny water culture, the clothing company is our big sponsor. They, when I had found them in 2012, um, they had created what I wanted to do. They had a website. Their website at the time had a, a blog, blog, whatever you want to call it. It had videos and it had stories. And I would sit there and I would just eat it up. And I read every single one of them. I watched every single video like 50 times. And I would just be on the edge of my seat waiting for more. Excuse me. And then I just started, you know, life, man. I, I started, I was teaching, I was working. And then I started, I quit that. I started guiding, but there was still that, I wasn't doing any of that anymore. Um, but I was still had that desire, that yearn inside of me. Uh, I talked to my wife about it and uh, we were, I started praying about it. And then I was at church and I met a guy um, at church who had been staying beside me for about a year. And uh, he worked there and he ran all the sound system stuff so we, we met and he's like, um, I think I'm following. we talked about fishing. And then the next week he said, Hey, um, what do you, what do you think about filming a TV show? And I started laughing. And he's like, why are you laughing? I was like, bro, cause I've literally the last six months have been praying about how to do this because I had the passion, the desire to do it. Mm-hmm. I just didn't have the equipment or the, like the, the roles were changing. Like I, I didn't want to be the guy behind the camera filming the, the fishing. I wanted to be the guy in front of the camera. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of changed and here is, was an opportunity. Well, we filmed five or six episodes over a year and a half and his life got really busy. His film stuff got busy. Um, and we had a separate, we had a part ways and I hated it. I hated it. Um, because we had a good connection and we were, we had some good stuff and he's really, really good. He's really, really good. Uh, but I look at it as an opportunity for God to kind of, hone in and, and, and focus, you know, I had this huge picture of what we were doing and then we, we'd done some stuff and I didn't really like some of the stuff I was doing. And so I was able to kind of over a year and a half work on that, mm-hmm. um, and kind of hone in the vision of what I wanted the show to be. And, uh, and then a year and a half later, I met Jack Bracken. I was introduced to Jack. Who's the main guy who films and edits the show. Does a um, great job. It looks awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You know, when we first went out that first episode, um, you know, you can, you can plan and you can think and you can process and you can come up with a, like, Oh, let's do this. But we talked about it. It's fish, it's the weather, it's things that you can't control. The first day we had booked, um, to film, there was actually a tournament that day. We had no idea. And so we show up and there's boats everywhere. <laughs> um, and so you kind of, you, we learned a lot. And through this four seasons, I tell people, um, you watch the first season, you can see the change in the first season. Like, all right, we got it figured out. No, we don't. We, we let's do this and let's do this. And we tweak the whole first mm-hmm. season. Second season was completely different. We had a plan. We had a vision. We knew what we want to do, but we wanted the fish to dictate what kind of was you we were seeing. Um, season three, we upgraded gear and it was mm-hmm. even better. And then now season four, uh, we got it dialed in the way we want to do it. Um, now I'm narrating. So there's been a, there's been a progression. Um, but that's how it started, man. It's just what here's, here's the goal. Here's the vision. Here's what I think God's telling me to do. And I got the green, white, green light for my wife and off we went. Um, and that first season was completely funded by my wife and I, um, which was a huge, um, it, we were, we've been saving for a house and to move and to buy something bigger for our boys and get land and, um, get away from the big city. And so for her to say, let's, let's pause that. And you go after that's how much she believed in, in my vision and my dream. 
And uh, so that's that's pretty incredible. It's a very special thing um, and a very selfless thing for her to do. And so I told her, I said, I'm going to work my tail off to get it to where we're not paying for it, um, but that we have buy-in from partners. Uh, I hate the word uh, sponsored. I don't want you to be a sponsor. I want you to, to have vision in this. I want mm-hmm. you to have ownership in this. I want you to believe in this. A sponsor just says, yeah, here's money, whatever. A partner stands beside you. And that's, that's the relationships I've been working on building with our, with our partners. Um, and so season two, I said, Hey, here's what we've done. Here's our numbers. Here's the vision. Here's the goal. Here's what we want. We've accomplished and here's what we want to do next. And, uh, we were able to fully fund, uh, the last several seasons, um, which has been great, which has been fantastic. Uh, full disclosure. I make, uh, $500,000 a year as of hosting a TV show. Yeah, right. Right. Like anything. I was going to say, whoa, dang. Really? Like, that's awesome. Do it. Like yeah. anything in this world, you have to work to become successful. I make nothing. Yeah. And my goal is to hopefully, please Jesus, is to step away from guiding full time and doing this because I love, I love doing this. I love the content creation. Um, but every day, every day we work, every day we grind, every day, uh, having this opportunity to connect with you and to connect with your audience, dude, that's huge for me. That's I'm so thankful. So I can share my vision. I can share who I am. I can share, talk to you about the show and for you to loan me your audience's ear for just a a brief moment. Dude, that's huge for me. And it's a huge honor for me. Um, So that's that every day we strive to get a little bit better and to create the best content we can so that when we do present to our, our partners, we can say, Hey, this is what we're doing. Here's our next goals. And that's what sent us to Texas. I had a, I had a, um, I had a partner say, listen, we have a product that we're trying to push in the state of Texas. I said, I'll go there. I'll drive there. I'll take, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll yeah. get there. Um, and I try to be a man of my word and that's just, we have fulfilled the commitments and we try to hold up the commitments. Um, and I think our partners uh, respect that. I think God honors that um, when you stand true to your word. So it's been, it's been a journey, my friend. It's been fun. It's been awesome. I'm excited about the next five years. Uh, and, um, you know, Rob Fordyce, he said in a podcast, he said, you know, people don't take shows seriously until you've reached your fifth season. Mm-hmm. I've worked my tail off to get to season five, which we're going to launch this year. Um, and we're going to do so in three years. And we're so ecstatic about that number. Uh, we just, Hey puppy, <laughs> I think the dog's hungry and he's going to the bathroom. Uh, that totally startled me too. Um, but we're, we just filmed episode 40 and we're, we're ecstatic about that and so excited. We, we, it would not be possible if it wasn't for, uh, for Jesus, for my wife and viewers just standing mm-hmm. alongside of us. You know, yeah. they're our partner, they're our biggest partner, yeah. um, to be able to take the time to invest that 22 minutes to sit down and watch the show. Yeah. And that means, that means the world to me. That means so much to me. Um, and I don't ever want to lose that because that's going to keep us hungry and keep us creating the best content we possibly can. Yeah, and I'm I'm so glad that you you brought that up because I'm in the same boat with this podcast. Like it's just a labor of love. I love getting to talk to people about stuff that I love and they love. And just like you and I talking right now, it's like, I'm learning a ton from you. And it's just like, you're getting to teach my audience about your life and this stuff. But they think if you're on in front of a camera, you have like this wealth and this fortune. I got my first podcast sponsors within the last six months. And like, it's the same way. It's like, we're partners. We work together. I asked them what they want. I was like, I can make anything that you want. You just let me know because you're helping me keep this thing afloat. I mean, this, this, this week, as we're talking is my hundredth episode. I was like, I didn't even think I'd be doing this. And now it's like, when you look back, you're like, I've already been doing this for years. It feels like a few weeks. And the opportunities that we get to do doing this stuff is amazing. I would have never met Derek through the podcast. I would have never met you. Through the, like, And it's just meeting cool people and doing cool stuff that you care about. And it shows in your work. I'm really, really glad that you have this much passion for it because you're like, 
you're 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 putting it all out there. You're you're leaving everything on the floor. You're making great content, and it's it's just amazing. So thank you for that, and thank you for being honest. Because as we both know, in this in this media world, there's a lot of not so honest people sometimes that you run into. So thank you for keeping it real. And before we go, I want to ask you one more question. This is probably the worst question to ever ask a fisherman, but. What's the dream fish? What's the one you haven't caught that you got to catch before it's all said and done at the end of the day and you're you're taking that bridge over to the other side, man? Oh. I know I hate to ask that question, but it's it's painful, but I got I just got to know. I I like to take a permit on fly. Um they're very hard to feed a fly to. Um I've had I had two shots. Um, one was in Key West and uh, I was with my wife and she, she booked a trip for me for my birthday. This That's year's wife. And um, yeah. And she didn't, she didn't really fish. She just watched and she loves to fish. And I caught my first permit that day with a spinning rod. Um, and then I had a shot and it, it got, it was, it was windy. I'm making excuses. Um, I missed the fish. <laughs> Um, so I've had an eat. We were filming in Miami in Biscayne Bay and I had two floating real high and they were in range and I, I, I needed to wait 10 seconds, but I did it because I, I was like, Oh yeah, here's my shot. And I, when I threw the fly and I, I hit him on the head. If I would have <laughs> waited, um, I would have waited 10 seconds. I would have had a better angle and I would have, presented that fish, that fly a little bit further in front. Um, but I got excited and I got in a hurry. Um, so bonefish on, I'm sorry, uh, permit on fly, um, is up there. Um, but <clears throat> dude, I've, I've, I don't catch another fish the rest of my life. I'm fine. Mm-hmm. More importantly, I want to see my kids. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> I want to see my kids catch fish. I want to spend time with my family um, catching fish. Like even even today, like I'm busy, bro. Bro, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm busy and we work hard and um, I'm doing all this with an effort because my kids are young. I got, I got a one-year-old and I got a three-year-old. And uh, so it's when dad's gone a lot, it's, they don't, I'm, my prayer is they don't remember because I'm gone a lot. Um, so my hope is to get this ball rolling into a point <clears throat> where I can spend less time building memories with families who aren't mine. Because as a fishing guide, I spend a lot of time with families who aren't mine, mm-hmm. um, which is awesome. I love it. I love it. Don't hear me incorrectly, but I want to have that experience with my kids. Yeah. So more than me catching a fish or more than me catching that permit on fly, um, which I probably could just call a buddy of mine and, and go fishing next week in Miami and make it happen. But I don't have time to do that. Yeah. Um, more important than that is seeing my kids light up and catch fish. And my oldest, who's three, um, he just turned three um, day after Christmas. Uh, which if you're gonna have a birthday, listen, guys, if I can help you out at all, don't have a birthday the day after Christmas because you're gonna, you're gonna get screwed the rest of your life. Yes. Um, and the funny thing is, he actually shares a birthday with my wife. So oh, man, yeah, crazy. Um, Misery loves company in that aspect. Yeah. That's right, dude. You got it. So, anyways, he just turned three and he's eaten up with fishing, dude. He just my um. My parents gave him a rod. So we've all been sick around here. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw my dad who came yeah, in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was all like, Nick, dad, it's not even cold outside. But he's like cold because it's, it's like in the 60s. Um, they bought him a fishing rod, a new fishing rod um, for his birthday. And he found it. Joker found it because we haven't had a birthday party yet because everyone's been sick. So he was snooping around in here yesterday and he found the fishing around. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to play with this dude. Like, can we go outside and cast? But he's told, he's, he's my mini me and he's out front yard. And he's like, so, you know, flinging that thing across the yard and reeling it. And he's like, oh, yeah. and he mocks me because he watches the show. And he'd be like, Oh, baby. I got it. 
<laughs> and it's so funny. So anyways, all that to say, <clears throat> that to me, my heart is, that's more important than anything I could catch. Um, yeah. But yeah. That's, yeah, that's, no, that's that's amazing. That's that's what you know. That's what it's all about to me too. And I, I I don't have any kids, but like when I can get a friend out there and watch them light up, man, it's like I don't even care if I'm fishing or hunting or whatever. It's like this amount of excitement is what I'm here for. Is like to get you hooked so that I have somebody to fish with too, so <laughs> and go out with. So uh, I really appreciate your time. I know you're a very busy man. And uh, where, like, if people want to watch the show, obviously I know it's on YouTube and stuff. But where can they find all your info? Where can they reach out? YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, all that fun stuff. And then we'll wrap her up, man. So if you want to watch a show, two places. You can go to Waypoint. Waypoint TV is amazing. And here's why. It's number one, it's free. It's available on any platform. You can download on your phone, on your tablet, on your smart TV, Roku, Fire Stick, Apple TV. I don't care what you have. You can go and download Waypoint and it's free. Not only that, number two, it is full of content. So offshore, inshore, freshwater, walleye. I don't care where you live in the country. There is a fishing show for you. And there's a ton of great, great shows on there. If you like to hunt, there's that too. If you like to do both, you can go back and forth. So Waypoint is a great place. Uh, the second place you can watch the show, go to YouTube. Uh, the Captain's Log TV is our YouTube handle. It's our, it's our, so it's our everything handle. So if you search the Captain's Log TV, you're going to find everything from Facebook, uh, YouTube, and Instagram like follow subscribe do all that good stuff because it helps me out tremendously and it keeps you up to date whenever we post new stuff uh, and we're doing so frequently um so there's the the two biggest places for the show <clears throat> last thing if you want to go fishing with me uh go castaway fishing charters here in orlando i do fresh water and i do salt water the salt water i do is inshore uh so shallow water flats fishing uh it's an hour from orlando so if you're in town for disney world and dad you want to sneak away from disney world and the lines i'm talking to you i know what you're talking i know you i, I feel you brother come on <laughs> give me a call and uh, go castaway.com is a website we can go fishing um and i love having kids on the boat i love having families on the boat and i got a boat that can do i have two boats and we can do both so whatever you want to do uh, we can take care of it. So go Castaway Fishing Charters and the Captain's Log TV. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I, I can't wait to see what you got coming up next on the show. I just, I love watching it. So just keep it up, man. What you're doing is awesome. You're bringing a lot of hope to a lot of people out there. So I appreciate that. Appreciate it, brother.